audio levels look pretty good. And uh, I'm gonna walk up there. Thanks, Frank. Let me try to hit the right button. Oh. Hello, everybody. I'm back again. This is the talk I was actually supposed to give. The description's a little bit off. I actually have a three hour class where I teach people um, how to use various dark nets, how to get around on them, and so forth. But it's way too big a topic to cover in um, something like this. But I'm basically doing a rehash of a talk I did a couple years ago with a few updates. Uh, and we're going to go over some of the dark nets that are out there, some ones you can check out. If someone references them, you know what they are. And, uh, well, here we go. A little bit about me. Well, I've already given this talk once before, so, well, this is part of the talk before. I'm Eden Crenshaw. I run iongeek.com. Infosec education stuff. Don't know everything stuff, especially when it comes to some of the darknet things, because those are some spots where the um, encryption protocols and how things peer together gets complicated real fast. Um, I'm also a senior information security consultant at TrustedSec. Got that lock. That thing was giving me fits for a while. Anyway, um, and co-founder of DerbyCon. If you want to reach me on Twitter, by the way, I'm geek underscore ADC. Okay, I'm going to be talking from two perspectives as far as dark nets are concerned. People trying to stay anonymous, and also a little bit about how people try to de-anonymize others. Uh, I'm not really a privacy guy. I'm one of these guys who likes to say, if I could know everything about everyone, I would. I'd have a distrust of people in general, I suppose. Um, and I see that a lot of people who have a lot of power get away with things that they wouldn't if people knew what they were up to. However, that being said, having power or, or um, gives you ha, having power allows you to buy more privacy. It's a different way of putting that. But I'm not really a, a huge privacy uh, enthusiast. But I just like crypto and um, networking and all that. So that's my interest in darknets. Also, I am not a lawyer. But some of the things you could do out on dark nets, you might want to be uh, careful where you go. Technically, usually some types of contraband are um, a strict liability. I mean, you, if, you, if you get some kind of contraband on your hard drive, it doesn't matter that you were doing research and you got it. You're still probably going to run into legal trouble if it's found. So if you see something called a Chan on a dark net, you probably want to avoid it. Anything that says lolly, you probably want to avoid it. Anything that has a little bear dancing around, want to avoid it. Any references to Julian Picard, or sorry, Julian Bashir or Captain Picard, you want to avoid that too. If you want explanations for all that later on, I can I can give it to you. Uh, be careful where you surf. Like I said, contraband awaits. I knew a researcher once who was looking around on dark nets, and he found a paper, or actually found a picture of himself there, because he just read a, a paper on how to de-anonymize a certain type of dark net. So his picture was there, and he tells me there was like child porn here. So even if you're doing legitimate research, it's nah, easy to get contraband that you don't want on your machine. So just giving you that little bit of warning. A little bit of background. How would you define what a dark net is? Essentially, a dark net is a private anonymizing network. It's a network that tries to make it so that you don't know who's serving something or you don't know who is accessing something. There's a couple other different uses of the term dark net. For instance, I think one of the earliest original uses was unused IP space, or actually IP space that you could get a message to, but because of routing, wouldn't come back. So kind of like a black hole. That was in the early days of ARPANET. Uh, then the term also came to be used for IP space that you own, but you set aside and you say, all right, we're not going to use any actual servers in here. So if anybody tries to reach those IP addresses, we know it has to be illegitimate traffic. That's another use of darknet. But the type of darknet I mean is just well, I like the term cipher space, because that, to me, is less ambiguous than darknet. Because you also have people use terms like deep web versus darknet, and the, the terminology gets a little messy. Usually deep web is anything that's not surface web, anything that is not necessarily like indexed by Google, or something behind a paywall or behind a password prompt, something that you can't, something that's not easily surface trawled via Google or a similar search engine would be a rough definition of, a, a, of deep web. And in that way, sometimes Tor isn't even deep web because there are search engines for it. Anyway, I like the term cipher space, though that really hasn't caught on. All right, so who's going to care about these dark nets? Uh, privacy enthusiasts who worry about censorship would be one. Firms worried about uh, policy compliance and leaked data. Also, some firms would be interested from the standpoint of keeping up with the competitors. I saw a talk in Ohio by a guy who was talking about using Tor to um, 
investigate your competitors without them knowing where you're coming from so they know it's you're investigating. For instance, if Target sees people from Walmart's IP space checking them out, they know something's up. If you're using Tor, they hopefully don't know that. Um, law enforcement also, because while I think most of the people on these dark nets are crypto weenies like me who just enjoy it, um, there are some seedier elements. So for average citizens, their interests might be, well, peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, now granted, still, if we're talking about copyright material, still illegal, but um, you're not nearly as likely to be busted for uh, uh, copyright infringement if you're using one of these networks. Also, censorship issues. You can publish something and not have it tied back to who you are, and so you can actually get a message out without it being tied back to you. Privacy in general, if you're surfing around the web through one of these dark nets, you can keep at least most of the information about you from going out there. There are some precautions to be made. In Frank's talk, we mentioned a few of them. For instance, uh, if you're using Tor, don't try to configure it all yourself. If all you're doing is surfing, use the Tor browser bundle or something better yet like Tails. Um, Tails is actually kind of nice because when you shut it down, it also tries the right memory. Have you ever um, have you ever heard of the cold boot attack? All right, some of you have, but I'll go ahead and go over what it is. Cold boot attack essentially is, even though it's been pulled out of your machine, your memory in your computer has a little bit of a lifespan before it totally dies. So in the cold boot attack, let's say someone has a machine locked, well, passwords and such are still up in memory. So with cold boot attack, they'll open up just enough of the laptop to get to the RAM, spray it down to get it cold, pull it out, put it in a device, and then copy all the memory out of it in that brief amount of time. That's one of the reasons that um, things like Tails wipes many memory when you shut it down properly. Also, just learning. Some of these dark nets are actually, well, some of them almost appear to be out there almost purely for educational purposes to learn about uh, IP routing without, without um, well, having to work for a major corporation. Corporations might care, like I said before, see what trade secrets have been leaked out there. There are various pastebin-like sites in dark nets. Also, um, see what personal inf identifier information someone might have um, leaked. Oh, uh, law enforcement might care because there are some criminal groups out there. There are apparently some terrorist groups out there. There's a fair number of pedos out there as well. So, the first dark net we're talking a little bit about is a nanonet and a DN42. And I'm throwing these two together because I usually connect to a nanonet and I, it has peerings with DN42, so you can kind of access both with one fell swoop. Um, what, what it is is a nanonet, um, and they've taken, and uh, sorry, also a DN42, they've taken IP set, sets that aren't normally writable on the internet. Now, uh, a nanonet took one something something something, one slash eight. That's since been assigned, but when they first started using it, it wasn't assigned. But that's what they use, so it's not to conflict like, with much of anything on the internet. And you set up peerings and VPN tunnels to each other, and you can actually set up your own BGP router and basically have your overlay network of the internet on the top of the internet. So if you want to learn about BGP routing protocols, that's one of the things that these kind of networks are great for. And actually, DN42 is um, very much geared towards that. It uses a different IP space, but um, those peerings between the two, so if you access a non-net, you can get on DN42. There's a bunch of hacker spaces and such that are also hooked up over this. Because if you want to learn that kind of layer of routing, I mean, unless you're working with um, big network gear or, you know, someone owns a lot of IP space, you're probably not going to get a chance to have that kind of experience in most jobs. But here you can use it as a virtual lab. Now, it's mostly about hosting internal services. But you also can get out to the public internet. There are out proxies. So you could use it for anonymously surfing the public web as well. And you generally do it by configuring OpenVPN. On Linux, because uh, I did this test on Kali Linux, it's super simple. Those are these install notes out there. But the simplest thing you do is app git install OpenVPN. Then go in wget the VPN settings. And this, by the way, is just to be a client. If you want to set up a full-time peer, that's going to be a little bit more effort. But they have information on the website on that too. Then you can run OpenVPN, point at your config file, and now you can access all these one something 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 networks and these 172 networks that are on Anonnet and DN42. This is an old, old image of how they had things peered at one time. I, this one's several years old. Uh, I believe it's a much, much more complex by now because more people have joined up. Uh, one time we actually tried to in map uh, all of Anonnet and came up with an interesting little um, chart of 
how things trace routed through. I'd like to do an update of this, though when I tried to do an update recently, I had uh, networking issues getting it all to work. Alex Carr from Question Defense put this one together for me. Uh, those some things to see on there, like those CGI proxy dot OCSI dot ANO, and that may or may not be down. I tried to visit it a little bit ago, and um, yeah, as of right now, it's down. Basically, it's a public out proxy that you can get on the public internet with. And let me see, it looks like my connection. No, it doesn't say my connection's dropped. So. What was that? Currently, though, it's not connecting to do. It's, out, it's an outbound public uh, proxy you can use to access the, the public internet. Um, well, I got to some other stuff on the non net. Like this web page, this little wiki that they host, that should have links off to um, some other services that are out there, uh, information on how to set up BGP routing and all that, and just tons more uh, tips. I haven't found a good search in for, engine for this. There is a good search engine for uh, DN42 though, yancey.dn42, where you can go out and search what else is available. They also have a list of internal services on this particular site, and you can find things like IRC service where you can chat anonymously with people. Now, this network has various pros and cons. The pros are it's fast. I mean, basically, it's overlay using OpenVPN. It's like VPNing into your home network. That then VPNs in someone else's home network into someone else's. It's it actually is relatively fast, and just about any IP-based protocol can be thrown over it. The cons to it, however, are the peers kind of have to know each other because of how they set up routing, so it's not as anonymous, and it's not like the protocol itself. Well, I mean, your VPN tunnel is going to be encrypted, but the people you're passing through each hop, assuming the traffic isn't encrypted by something else in the middle, assuming it's not like using HTTPS or whatnot, people would be able to take a look at it. Also, there's not a lot of services out there, and services drop in and out of existence. But that's pretty much true of all the darknets. Someone will host a web page for a few months, and then it disappears, or maybe a few years, and then it just goes away, and you never know what happened. Now, what does the traffic look like? Uh, generally, it's using, uh, and I think I have a typo there. I think there's a port uh, 5555 TCP and 5550 TCP, though this may have changed, and sometimes port 22. Uh, basically, whatever the open uh, VPN clients and servers are configured to use. So, those are the ones I've seen in the past them being used. Um, there's similar networks like um, .NET conglomeration. Though, as far as I can tell, this one may have gone away. VAnet, uh, Chaos VPN, and there's other people who have basically done this. We're all going to peer together via VPNs and experiment with uh, networking. But that's uh, nah, a good network to go out and learn on, I suppose. Then there's Freenet. Um, Freenet, and I like this quote, it kind of makes me think of uh, how Freenet and some TORs and I2P uh, like networks of work. All the world will be your enemy. Prince of a thousand enemies, and when they catch you, they will kill you. But first, they must catch you. Watership Downs is a book about um, essentially a burrow, sorry, a burrow of rabbits. Is that the right terminology? Anyway, when I think of Freenet, I kind of think of that quote. I'm not sure that's why they chose the rabbit logo, but. The Freenet project uh, was started by Ian Clark. It's, um, I'll give you the definition of why they created it. Freenet is free software which lets you anonymously share files, browse and publish free sites, these are websites only accessible through Freenet, and chat on forums without fear of censorship. Basically the way it works is you have documents you can inject in the Freenet. And it's almost like a distrib it's almost less like a network and more like a distributed, um, distributed storage system. And the how of it is you have a local proxy that you use to interact with it. You're actually always accessing your local host, but you're requesting documents and injecting documents out there. So if I was to give you an example of that, let me see. Like here is a document. Notice I'm on local host. This is a particular document I've requested. Long name there. And this is essentially a document that has links off to other documents. The way Freenet works is you inject a document into the network. It gets spread out amongst other hosts in an encrypted form. Some things I recall reading saying that even if you have a piece of contraband in your machine, while you're storing part of the file, you don't necessarily know what's in the file. Yeah, and there's some bad stuff out there as well. Um, 
But you inject something out there, it gets distributed amongst the, the clients, and then you can disconnect from the network. And there's some, um, there is some uh, redundancy in there. So let's say you try to put something out there, it gets spread out there. When you try to request a file, it gets passed back to you at each hop along the way. Well, I got a picture for that. Let's say um, A requests something out. There's going to be a hop count for how many hops it'll go before it doesn't find it. Well, it'll go out through the network and hopefully because of all the interconnections between people, it works on a small worlds model where it'll pass it on from node to node. Do you have this? Oh, you don't? Change the hop count, go on to the next node until it finds the stuff and then that gets returned back through the network to the person. And each spot it returns through caches that particular bit of data. That way, something that's requested a whole lot gets more redundancy. Stuff can slowly but surely disappear out of Freenet if it's not, ever, it's not requested anymore. If no one requests them for a very long time, eventually probably none of the nodes will have it. But in here you see the, uh, the outbound path took several hops of people who didn't have it so it finally found someone who did have it, then goes back to the original requester, and all the nodes along the way make a cached copy. What it looks like, like I said before, you just have um, a browser pointing to localhost, port 8888, and um, you can check out a couple of the index sites. You can take your key and give it to other people so they can download stuff. And there are several different types of keys out there. Like Here's an example of what a URI would look like. This is a little USK. Um, I think that might actually be the one I pulled up in the browser a bit ago. There's a CHK, content hash keys. These keys are used for static content. And the key is a hash of the content to help you find it. Um, you ever heard of distributed hash tables? I really wish I could come up with a good image to describe how distributed hash tables work. Uh, but essentially, some peer-to-peer -peer networking, oh, sorry, some peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software also uses it. Like if you ever used, um, uh, trackerless a bit torrent you're working with a distributed hash table basically you go okay when I hash the data this is my hash this hash is closest to this person's identifier for who should be storing information about that hash I give it to them I give it to a few others in a similar nature so there's redundancy also if someone churns which is basically when people come on to the network off of it they might have some protocols for saying okay I'm no longer going to take care of these keys, these hashes, you pass them on to someone else. But basically it's a way of having this distributed database throughout the network where there's no single point of failure. That's the core idea. And that's the core idea also between Tor's um, uh, trackerless system so you don't have to have a single system at the point of failure where people can take that out and then the network's busted. There's uh, SKS, uh, sorry, SSK, signed subspace keys, used for sites that could change over time. It is signed by the publisher of the content, likely superseded seated by the uh, USKs. So basically, if you have a document but you want it to change over time, it doesn't have to be a static document that's out there. Um, USK, updatable subspace keys, really just friendly wrappers for SSKs to handle versions of a document. And KSKs, keyword signed keys, easy to remember because of simple keys like, well, KSK, my text, but, um, so there can be the name collisions depending on who's injecting what. That's one of the problems with naming. Have you ever seen a, who's ever actually been to a uh, .onion site? The uh, URLs are ugly, right? There's a bit of a problem between having convenient names you can type in and having something secure because you have to give your trust to somebody. Um, you can have a simple name like irongeeks.i2p. This is the way I2p does it. But you have to trust the people you're requesting that name from to give you, well, let's say on the public internet. Let's say anybody could interchange any DNS entry they wanted. What would happen? If you don't trust your ISP to be honest with how they do DNS, what could they do to you? Troll you, send you to ad sites, which some do on bad searches or, or, or typos. Um, take something that they say is taking you to your bank, but actually redirect it to their own site, that kind of thing. We have the same problem on I2P. Well, I don't know if it's a problem. It depends on how you trust those people. Because they're all people who do have essentially what amounts to a DNS service. But how much do you necessarily trust those people to keep it updated and not to be taken over by someone else who might be malicious? Uh, so far, it's worked out. Um, that's one of the reasons the Onion addresses all what they are. Um, 
But all right, there's many modes of operations for this. There's open net, which you let everybody peer with you. Then there's dark net, where you basically can have friend-to-friends -friend connections where you only share things amongst yourselves, which is a little bit more secure. Applications for this particular network would be things like JSite. JSite allows you to inject content into the Freenet network. And like I said before, the nice thing about it, unlike me hosting my ITP um, site, that, which I do have an ITP site, I have to keep a server running for that ITP site to be there. You could inject something into Freenet, and that document stays out there even if your machine goes away. There's Freemail, which is basically an email system on top of uh, Freenet. Uh, Frost, so this gives you like Usenet form like functionality, and Thor for file sharing. Uh, Freenet pros and cons once you inject something into the network, it can stay there for as long as it's routinely requested. Like I said, every time it gets routed around and says, okay, I don't have the document, I don't have the document, oh, I do have the document, pass it back, each node on the way back gets a copy of it. So if something's requested enough, not only is it going to be faster to get it, it's going to be more reliably um, cached places and require more redundancy. Seems to do a decent job of keeping people anonymous. Awesome for publishing documents without having to maintain a server. So if someone was just wanting to release info to the public but not wanting to know who was releasing it, it's probably a more ideal um, solution than something like um, Tor I2P. Cons, it's dog slow. It's recommended that you start it up and leave it running. Like I actually have a connection going right now. It's OK. And that's because I have it running for the last few hours. Because you have to know about other peers. Um, I believe peers are also told to you by the distributed hash table. You may get a few when you initially install and says, oh, wait, go talk to these guys. And these guys will tell you about other people who are using Freenet. So even if the server that ha hosts the software goes down, because of the distributed hash table, you'll still be able to stay on the network. It's UDP based. Um, and uh, sometimes that causes problems with uh, if you're behind a NAT box, it's a little bit of an issue. Though I believe if you turn on universal plug and play, it'll handle it itself. I don't recommend that. Check to see what ports it says it's using and go ahead and just port forward those particular ports on your NAT box. Um, it's also not used for accessing the public internet like Tor is. ITP also really doesn't uh, focus much on the external internet, though it does have that capabilities. Also, it's not meant for like standard IP protocols. You're never going to be able to really. I, don't, I can't really say never, but it's not something you'd be able to SSH into a server inside of the darknet on. It's more, like I said, a distributed storage system. But there's still a lot you can do with it. As far as what traffic looks like, local, you're accessing everything over um, 8888. And I believe the system itself is controlled. I believe this is a free, free net uh, control port, so what FCP was. I'm not sure on that. It's been a while since I put that in the slide. On 9481. As far as what UDP ports it's talking over, uh, it's supposed to be random. Oh, so I understand. That brings me to Tor. We just covered uh, two networks, well, technically three networks, that you may have not heard of before. Tor, I hope everybody in the room has heard of Tor, right? OK. The who of it? This was first um, came out of a US Navy research lab. Then the EFF took it over, and now uh, Tor is its own 503c nonprofit. You can find more info about it on, at the torproject.org. Now, the why of it, and I'll just use, once again, the whys for why they developed it. Tor is free software and an open network that helps you defend against a form of network surveillance that friends personal freedom and privacy, confidential business activities and relationships, and state security known as traffic analysis. The what of it is you can access normal internet sites with it, or you can access Tor hidden servers, servers that are hidden inside of Tor's network and people who are using the Tor engine. Um, how you access it is generally over a local SOX proxy that you point your browser at or your IRC client at or whatever it is you're trying to proxy through Tor. Now Tor has bi-directional tunnels. The way you're sending data out is also the way it's coming back to you. So well, it's also Tor is like an ogre. It has layers. So I was hoping I had a, I thought I had an icon there. No, I don't. Okay. Tor it, um, uses something called directory servers also. So we have a central point of failure to a degree for keeping information about the system. Uh, a while back, uh, China blocked the Tor directory servers. And this caused a problem for people 
trying to access Tor because they couldn't get a list of nodes to connect to. That's one of the reasons that things uh, like oh <coughs> hidden uh well hidden routers are out there where you can request a few that are not announced publicly and use them and configure your Tor browser to use those instead. So even if they block the directory server, you can still get to some of these Tor nodes, and they can't possibly block all these Tor routers out there. And I'll cover those more in a bit. But okay, Tor is like an ogre. It has layers. So let's say you want to send a message to Tor for requesting a public internet site. You're, by default, you're going to have like three levels of encryption on it. Well, maybe four if it's also HTTPS underneath all that. The first layer goes to the first hop in your proxy chain. And you've exchanged keys with them, but they only have the ability to decrypt that one layer. And they don't know what, what the message is or where it's initially going, because that part's still encrypted. But they can strip off their layer and send it on to the next node. This person doesn't know who originally sent it into the network, doesn't know where it's actually going to go in the, in the final run, where its actual destination is, and it can only decrypt its one layer. Then it finally gets to the exit point, that gets decrypted, and then whatever the data was supposed to be gets sent out on the public internet. And then the whole process goes back the opposite direction, re-encapsulating it, kind of like a Russian nesting dolls. But by using these multiple hops and multiple levels of encryption, no one totally, no one knows both who sent it in originally and or what it was that was being sent or what it was that was being requested. Assuming everything works right. There are ways it can get screwed up. Um, I hate it when I say um like that. I need to catch that. Anyway, darknet sites work a little bit differently. Let's say you want to make a Tor hidden service. It's a bit different. So first step is Alice with the Tor client obtains a list of Tor nodes from the directory server. And um, basically establish the connection out to the public internet. That's what this one is. Uh, let's see. Actually, I pretty much already covered this. I'm going to go on to the hidden service one because my previous slides covered it. Okay, it's creating a hidden service. Bob picks some introductory points and builds circuits to them. Bob is hosting some kind of hidden service. This is usually going to be a website. It could be a server you could SSH into, though. It could be an IRC server. It doesn't really matter. But they set up some introductory points. And then they send that to the DB. Originally, I thought the DB was supposed to be one of the directory servers, but apparently they do use a distributed hash system of a sort for um, keeping a database of hidden services that are out there. So Bob advertises the Onion site. Alice hears about this, and she goes out and requests info from the database. She also sets up a rendezvous point through which she can uh, have some stuff set up to connect her and Bob. So she gets enough info from the database to be able to contact Bob. Through the introductory points that Bob had chosen, there's some key information that's exchanged, and the rendezvous point is uh, told to Bob via the introductory points. And then they can start communicating through the rendezvous point. Though the rendezvous point, keep in mind, also has several other hops between it. In this illustration, it looks like you're just talking through one machine, and that one machine would know who the two people are communicating, but in reality, there's actual multiple hops in that. And then they can proceed to communicate with each other. Does that make sense? To really follow it, it's better to read the text dec uh, description and just follow your way through it. Um, there's different types of nodes inside of Tor. There's the client node, which is you just being the average user. Let's say you're running the Tor browser bundle. There's relays, and these are ones that relay traffic. By default in Tor, you are not a relay unless you choose to be. There are actually some reasons to choose to be a relay, because if you're passing other people's traffic through you, it may confuse traffic analysis attacks, because everything that's being sent on Tor from your node isn't necessarily your stuff. So it may confuse people and uh, not have them really know what you're up to either, uh, though it also might draw attention. Bridges, bridges, I'm, remember I mentioned before, and I wasn't coming up with the right term, where I mentioned uh, China blocked uh, the Tor directory servers? Well, bridges are meant to stop that, and uh, most Tor nodes, you can go and look out there on the directory servers and find all the Tor nodes. You know all the points where people, someone might be getting into the Tor network and block them all. 
the way bridges work is there's no central repository of all of them. Well, not exactly at least. None where the public can get to it. But what you can do is you, there's certain services you use to request just a couple bridges at a time. Use those bridges, and so if someone's trying to block Tor, you have to manually configure your Tor browser to use these particular bridges, and then you can still get out. Make sense? Um, you can, oh, used to be a, a site you could request these from, and I believe there's also an email address you can email and get a few of these bridges. There's also Tor uh, guard nodes. The way Tor sets things up, it's not completely random what your first hop is. There's a certain set of nodes it considers more trusted. The idea behind guard nodes is if the first person in your chain of proxies is controlled by the same, or if that first proxy is controlled by the same person as the last proxy, they can do a traffic analysis attack more easily. So, for instance, it'd be really dumb if, um, let's say, Marshall is hosting multiple Tor routers. Well, having the first entry point be one here at Marshall and the exit point be one here at Marshall would be a bad idea because they could easily collaborate with each other and go, oh, I see two megs of data coming in here, two megs going out here, one meg coming back in, one meg going back out here, and quickly know, oh, this must be the same connection. So there's actually also parts of the algorithm that say, let's not have two hops be too close together in the IP space. But guard nodes are meant to make sure the first hop is likely a more trusted one. Um, introduction points are helpers to make connections for hidden servers, and rendezvous points are used for relaying and establishing connections to hidden services. What it looks like, well, this is a little bit of an older um, pick, but normally the way you're going to access it is via the Tor browser bundle. It's nice from the standpoint, it's already configured to use Tor, it has a bunch of stuff disabled, by default it's in privacy mode, and um, it just does extra things to keep you from doing something silly and getting yourself compromised. A better step would probably be to use uh, Tails. Tails is that Linux distribution we were talking about earlier. It actually has extra firewall rules to make sure things in general can't go any place unless they're going over Tor. So I believe I have the Tor browser here. Fired up. Firefox is already running. Lovely. All right. We may have to come back to you in a bit. Right, close that down. Oh, sorry, I actually do have the Tor browser up. Let me bring that back up. I didn't see that. All right. So you just have your own little special browser that has been configured and hardened to hopefully um, make it less likely for things to happen bad. For instance, it won't necessarily easily let you click on a Word doc, open the Word doc, then all of a sudden have the Word doc start requesting images off a public Internet site not using Tor and reveal what your real IP address is. If you ever looked at, um, I think it's uh, Marcus J. Carey's project, Honey Docs, basically you can send people Word Docs and other types of documents, and they will contact you out over the public internet and tell you who opened that document. Uh, the Tor Browser Bundle does some things to keep you from doing that by accident. And you can get around on it, and there's all sorts of um, sites you can visit. Let me see what we got. Do we have any good ones right here off the top? Information on running, Tor relays, and uh, let me see, I'm going to have to copy out a URL to actually visit. But you, I'd recommend just using the Tor browser. That's probably going to be a lot safer. Uh, if you happen to configure it on your own machine and you want to use a GUI, there's also uh, Vidalia, which is a little GUI config for using Tor, though it's no longer part of the Tor browser bundle. Now, applications and sites you might want to use with it. Uh, check out Tails. That's that Linux distribution we were talking about that has extra precautions in place to keep you from going out on the public internet where you don't mean to. The Tor to Web proxy, which hopefully still exists, these various proxies go, come in and out. Um, it allows you to access the Tor network from the public internet. So if you want to visit a particular .onion site, you could actually point at this browser at this site and proxy into it. The downside is this person knows your real IP address, whoever they are. So you know, you may not want to necessarily do that. All right, let me escape out of this. And actually, let's see if we can visit this site. Assuming that here at Marshall, we actually got the network completely functional. All right, we're going to go back here. And we'll check back on it in a, fit, in a second. Um... But if you go to the hidden wiki, it'll point you off to a bunch of other sites you may want to check out. 
Uh, it also gives you information about the Tor network. Uh, Scallion, you, if you ever, um, well, if you ever saw the Silk Road's address, you'll notice like the first few character, characters of it are actually Silk Road. The way they did that is they essentially did what the equivalent of a password crack was to be able to brute force uh, a name that would have the first so many characters they actually wanted. If you're only doing like eight characters, it's feasible to do. Um, Scallion lets you do that. Like I generated a key for Iron Geek, some gibberish, dot onion. There's also things like Onion Cat, which are meant to allow you to uh, proxy more things over Tor. And uh, Reddit Onions, if you want to know about Onion sites or um, Tor in general, go check out Onions. But I believe you can find some announcements in there of um, various dot onion sites. Got to keep in mind that a lot of these sites come and go. You'll, they'll be around for a while, then disappear. Okay, the hidden wiki. It moved and it's hopefully going to take me to the hidden wiki inside. Now this is what a Tor address, a Tor.onion address normally looks like. Not exactly very user friendly. But inside of here, you'll find links off to all sorts of other information. Um, find search engines you can use inside. Let's see. Find financial services. Some place in here there's probably a list of black markets. Hosting and uh, web sites and files and images and so forth. Some forms are in here. Probably some chans. Uh, backup copy of Wikilinks for anybody who wants to access it not over the public internet. Just a ton of different sites you can go visit. And I saw some dark markets up there earlier. Grams as well. Oh yes, Grams is a search engine, if I'm not mistaken, for uh, darknet markets. I think I have a link for that in one of my slides. Now the pros and cons of Tor. If you can turn it over a SOX proxy, you can make it work with this protocol pretty much. Uh, it has three levels of proxying by default. Um, I guess more than that when you're talking about uh, hidden services. So it's relatively anonymous. There's been some attacks, but most of the attacks have involved things on the client level or because the uh, the person who was using it did something stupid. Um, for instance, uh, uh, Oldwork, he, the guy who was running the original Silk Road, got caught because he was asking you asking for advice on um, doing various things with Bitcoin using his email address on Gmail that actually had his real name in it, like R. Ulbrich. He was doing various things like that, um, and that kind of led to his um, downfall. He'd also do things like sign up with one name. Uh, change it to something else like Frosty as one of the handles he used, but then some of the uh, usernames on a box that was hosting uh, Silk Road also had Frosty as a username. Some of the code he was asking for help for on uh, Stack Overflow was the same code that was found on Silk Road, so on and so forth. Basically, he left a lot of um, crooked crumbs leading back to him, and it really wasn't so much a technical exploit of Tor that got him. It's not 100% clear to me. I need to go back and search the, the court documents that have come out since. But I somehow get the impression that they busted one of his admins. The admins gave him access to the, to the server. Once you have access to that, you actually have the IP of the server, more than likely. Then you go confiscate it, make an image, get as much data as you can from it. Also, he, um, he connect, connected directly to one of these servers from a coffee shop nearby where he, um, where he lived. Cons. It can be slow, though it's, it's improved massively in uh, speed over the last several years. It has a semi-fixed infrastructure. For instance, uh, the incident I mentioned before where the Great Firewall of China blocked 80% of Tor relays because they were listed in the directory, which is why you know, bridges are important to have around. And it, it's fairly easy to tell someone who's using it on the server side. I have scripts uh, on my site that instantly tell me if you're using Tor to visit me. So. If you visit my website, depending on whether or not you're using Tor or I2P, it changes what the logo is. Let me do this here also. Assuming it's actually going to out-proxy. That connection may end up failing. Anyway, here's me visiting over Tor, and you can easily spot someone who's using Tor. Uh, there was actually a guy in, um, oh no, it wasn't Princeton, Harvard I believe it was who issued a bomb threat, and he did it over Tor because he wanted to get out of class. He had like some kind of final or something, or midterm, and he wanted to get out of the class, so he tried to put in a bomb threat. We traced it down and said, oh, the person who emailed this was doing it over Tor, 
they traced down who all on the network was using Tor at the time, and it kind of pinned it down on him. If he had used the coffee shop down the road instead of using the university's Wi-Fi to access Tor, he probably wouldn't have got caught. Also, if he just didn't admit to it, he may not have got caught, because I have to imagine those other people on the Harvard network using Tor at the same time. He just was the one they were talking to. That's also true. I told you I'd be looking at this from two perspectives now. OK, local-wise, what do you see? Locally, you're going to have ports 9050 and 9051 open. Uh, these are incremented by 100 if using the Tor browser bundle. The reason they do this is you might have a fixed installation of Tor for hosting your hidden service, but you're using the uh, browser bundle for your personal web surfing. That might be one reason why you would do this. Remote, most of the traffic seems to go over 443 and 80, mostly. And uh, you may also see some servers that are listening on port 9100 for directory information on uh, uh, 9030. I have more information about these, about how to detect Tor and so forth, at my site, and Mubix has some on his site as well. There's also something I need to spend some more time researching. The Tor uh, traffic, even if you didn't know uh, a particular server you're con contacting as part of the Tor network, you can kind of tell it's Tor traffic because of the way the packets look. Even though they're encrypted, there's certain sizes you can look at and say, oh, this is probably Tor traffic. So there's actually been work done on OS, OBSFU proxy uh, to make Tor traffic look like something else. Was that? Yeah, ob obfuscate. But OBSFU proxy tries to make the traffic look like something else. This could be something like HTTP traffic, Skype traffic, just to make it a little bit less obvious. Because if people know, oh, there's a term for this particular dilemma. If, uh, if people know that you're sending traffic, even though they know what it is, just the fact that you're trying to remain anonymous may raise some flags with some people. Now, places to see, there's a ton of different Onion sites out there you could visit. Core.onion is a little index page, a little starting point. Uh, Tor directory, Hidden Wiki, which we visited earlier, Onion List, which is something similar, Tor links, which is something similar. There's a New Yorker strong box if you want to submit some uh, tips to the newspaper anonymously. And then there's Grams, which is an underground, uh, well, Underground black market search engine is the best thing to call, call it. If you want to search for something that's a contraband, that's something like, let's say, drugs or uh, guns where it might be illegal to have them, like in great, various parts of Great Britain, depending on the type of gun, you can go out there and maybe find it on grams. A lot of things, these dark markets use Bitcoin for exchange. Bitcoin's a little bit beyond what I'm going to be able to easily explain in this uh, talk, but it's a type of cryptocurrency. It uses proof of work to essentially generate value. Proof of work was an idea that originally came out of, of um, as an idea to stop spam back in the late 90s. The idea is you'd ask the person who uh, is trying to send an email to solve a problem before you actually accept the email. This might be something along the lines of, well, I know a password. Here's a hash. Find me what my password is. That might be a proof of work thing. It's real quick to take a password and find the hash to know whether or not they got the right answer, it takes a long time to take a hash and turn it into a password. That would be an example of a proof of work. Bitcoin, though, works on proof of work. You have addresses and private keys, and you can basically take the Bitcoins you have and assign them over to others. All this is keeping track of in this big blockchain, this ledger that everybody keeps of uh, who's exchanged what. There's things called tumblers to kind of confuse who's actually exchanged Bitcoins. Uh, so it's kind of like a money laundering in a way. I suppose it just redirects transactions so it's harder to trace who exchanged with who. Bitcoin's a little bit beyond what I can easily explain, especially in the amount of time left. And I'm not sure I'd be able to explain it nearly as well as Bob Weiss can. But I have a talk of his out there from uh, B Sides Delaware from 2013. You should probably check out. Tons of more Tor hidden services are out there besides web services. Those are IRC, so if you want to remain anonymous while chatting with certain people on the internet. Well, there's also the IRC servers, and there's also people who have made their own private Tor-based ne networks, like Iron Key. I'm not sure they're still doing this on the modern Iron Keys, but for a while, at least, they had their own Tor network that you could use. And since they were doing it all on commercial servers and it had a little more um, juice to it, at the time, at least, it was faster than the public Tor. Not sure that's true at this point, though. That brings me to I2P. I2P, it was originally developed by um, a guy named J Random, as in J Random Hacker. The idea behind it is to act as an anonymizing layer on the internet. It focuses more though on the hidden service element than outproxing the public internet. 
there is an out proxy, or at least there has been in the past. It is not currently um, working right now. But its main focus is things like hidden services. In the case of websites, that'd be an EAP site. But also to allow peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and so forth, it comes built in with the web server already there for setting up EAP site. It already has the software in there for doing peer-to-peer -peer and whatnot. And the how of how you access it is locally ran proxies you can connect to and control via a web browser. And this allows you to set up I2P tunnels and communicate over them. And in, like, unlike Tor, which uses a, a directory server for some things, this is all distributed hash tables. So if the core servers went down, it could still function. And they call that a little distributed hash table NetDB. Another thing that's a little bit different about uh, I2P is the tunnels are not bidirectional. You're going to send out a request through one set of tunnels. In this case, we have like three hops that Charlie is making a request. It goes in the end tunnels of the person who might actually be hosting something. It goes through like their number of hops. By the way, these number of hops are completely configurable. You can choose to be more private or faster, depending on what you want. And then it will actually travel back to the person via a different set of connections. This causes more problems with doing traffic analysis to figure out who's talking to you on a network. And those slides I, have no, I don't think I'll be able to get to. As I mentioned, uh, it's not bidirectional. Your ends and your out tunnels are not necessarily the same. They're not necessarily taking the same paths. Yes. Along with the three-hour class about how to actually configure all this stuff and get on it. It also uses something similar to the way Tor does onion routing. It does what it calls garlic routing, where you can mix messages together and send them on. My understanding, technically, it doesn't do this right now, but the protocol could allow for it in the future, is you might send a message through a tunnel, and parts of it go to different people. Or it might mix traffic from other people together and then send it on. Though I asked ZZZ, the lead developer right now, and apparently this is not an accurate depiction of the way it works. But just keep in mind, it's similar to Tor and the, the multiple hops happening. But um, how it mixes traffic is a little bit different. And there's several layers of encryption. You're encrypted end-to-end -end with one set of encryption. You're encrypted all of one tunnel and all of the next tunnel with a different level of encryption. And then each hop along the way has its own level of encryption. A combination of Elgamal, AES, and uh, more AES using Diffie-Hellman exchanges. What does it look like? You generally configure it via a web browser. You can set up how uh, long you want your tunnels to be. You can set up things like, do I want to host a website? You can get into the built-in peer-to-peer file sharing software based on BitTorrent. Now, by default, the addresses are going to look something like this. There are naming services out there, which basically amount to a distributed host file. Way back in the public internet, before um, DNS took off, there actually were people who maintained host files that you would exchange with each other to map names to IP addresses. The problem with these naming service, services is if they ever get taken over by someone bad, they might redirect you to a different key. There's also uh, base32 addresses that look like this gibberish right here that you can use without having to use Suzy DNS. I'm going to see if I can actually access irongeeks.i2p. I may or may not be able to, depending on what all is blocked here. I may not be able to visit this. Let's see if I can use a jump service to get to it. I'll open a few new tabs. see if any of those ones actually connect. That may or may not work depending on how this network here at the university is set up. IGP pros and cons. Pros, lots of supported applications. A lot of people have ported things to work with IGP, and it comes built in with a bunch of applications, like I said, the web server and uh, file sharing server, and um, links off instantly to you know, IGP's email system if you want to use it. Uh, you can create just about any hidden services if you can proxy it over SOX tunnel. By default, you're using HTTP tunnels or HTTP proxies for most of your EAP site surfing, but you can configure SOX proxies as well. In the past, to me, it seemed faster than Tor hidden services. That's not so true now. Tor has done a lot of work and has improved that a whole lot. No central point of failure, so you don't have to worry about so much about the um, issue with uh, directory server being taken out and people not being able to get into the network. No, Tor also has some countermeasures to that as well. Cons. Limited out proxies is not really for public, serving the public internet. And as you saw earlier, the default out proxy is either down or I just can't connect to it right now. 
and um, also possibly more prone to civil attacks. The advantage of having a centrally controlled thing like Tor is you might be able to spot bad actors earlier because there's one set of people that can say, oh, yeah, they're doing something bad, they're doing something bad. A civil attack is where you have one entity controlling multiple nodes and using them as, well, sock puppets to control the way the network works. And in theory, ITP might be a little bit more prone to that. Tons of different EAP sites out there, including my own, which is irongeeks.i2p, which I'm not going to be able to bring up. And I am running out of time, so I won't be able to cover various attack strategies, probably, but we can cover the rest of this. Oh, there's IRC built into I2P. You just have to point your IRC client at it. Just be sure when you do that, you go into your ident information and make sure it doesn't have something you don't want there. For instance, by default, the IRC client I was using would choose my username off the local machine. Since I was Adrian, anybody who did a, like a right click and fingered me and figured out who I looked up my information would see, oh, he signed in as Adrian. That gives them a little bit too much information about me. Um, Suzy Mail's already built in there for sending email, BitTorrent. Uh, you can download an email client if you want. Oh, Tahoe uh, LAFS, that's a distributed file system, sort of like uh, what I was talking about with Freenet. And uh, there's a ton more plugins out there. Now, I don't have time for the correlation attacks because you're up at, um, you're up at three, right? Jason, you're up at three. Alrighty, well, I think I'm going to um, call, actually, no, let me cover this real quick, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go a little long too then. Now, some basic attacks on dark nets. There's correlations of endpoints and exit points. What you might do is just watch how the traffic's flowing through there, and while it's all encrypted, encrypted with different keys at every point, you, if you see someone make a 5 meg request into the network, and you see an 8 meg response come back through, and you see it go through these two nodes, that same kind of pattern, as far as the timing and sizes, you can use that kind of signal as intelligence to know someone might be well, who, figure out who's talking to who. Um, timing correlation also about when the uh, communications are happening along with the sizes. You could do things like DOS certain servers you suspect to be in the flow of the traffic and see how that causes a reaction to the traffic going over the uh, network. For instance, if you suspect a certain server may be hosting um, a Tor hidden server, you can try to attack or DDoS its public internet facing side and see if you see a reaction to traffic going over the darknet or see if that site just disappears. You could also possibly pulse traffic as it was going through, like, like say you're in the hops along the way, you can try to delay the message to sort of like tag it and then if you see that timing difference later on down the line you might be able to figure out who's talking to who. Uh, change the load on a path to possibly do the same kind of um, modification of timing, so hopefully you may be able to spot that further down the line. There's actually a, oh, I've, I've read some the, the Snowden documents where there was a tool they were talking about, I think it was called a Imagineer, that was something similar to this. Thor's Hammer, how do you pronounce Thor's Hammer? I didn't ask that question every single time I do this <laughs> talk like this. Mojineer, something along those lines, which sounded something along those lines. Uh, other flaws, DNS leaks, if you don't configure Tor properly, there's another reason to use the Tor well, it wants me to be done. If you don't use the uh, Tor browser bundle or you don't configure your um, browser properly, there's something called DNS leaks where it will make a request for the uh, uh, hidden site to your DNS server first to try to find its IP address, even though it's not on the public internet. None of the data you want to send to that network is actually being sent to your DNS server, but your DNS server still knows that, oh, this person tried to access the Silk Road. It would go something along this. If you have your SOX proxy not set in Firefox to say, do DNS lookups over proxy, it may send them out to the public internet. So in that case, you're requesting Silk Road something 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 dot onion. That DNS entry, though, goes to your DNS server at your ISP, and they have an idea of, who you're trying to visit. Y yeah, uh, Tor Browser Bundle already has it configured right from the beginning, and you can configure it right in Firefox yourself, but if you're just going to be a client, use the Tor Browser Bundle or use Tails. Uh, let's see. You can also do things like uh, make a hidden server contact you over the public internet. I have a demo of this, I think, from last ShowMeCon. Essentially, if you can find a web flaw on a 
on a website, on a Tor hidden service or EAP site, exploit that flaw, let's say it's command injection, have it ping you from its real IP address and then listen for the traffic and figure out who the real person is behind it all. So you'd send some exploit code and have it shovel a shell back to you over the public internet to know who they are. If they have anything like um, any flaws along lines of command injection. I have a ton more sites on darknets. These are my Tor IGP notes, which I tried to access the uh, EAP site version of, but I can't seem to get out on this network today. Uh, I also have a class on darknets. It's about three hours long if you want to watch that and actually play around with these. Uh, I have an overview of uh, darknets and attack strategies uh, that I did for various conferences here recently. I did DEF CON and Show Me CON last year. And, uh, Oh, if you want information on setting up Tor, that video I have is one of the first videos I did. It's really old. I, now that I think about it, I don't recommend it because Tor has changed so much since then about how to easily get on it. And if you want information about hidden services, I also have some information about setting those up. I think in that video I set up a, like a SSH server inside of uh, the Tor network. A quick announcement, DerbyCon's coming up. I think tickets go on sale on May 1st. Come if you can. I'm told that hotel spacing is a little bit limited right now, though. And uh, finally, are there any questions which you can ask me later because I'm going to get out of the way for Jason. Thank you very much.